can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to The Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck, and today our guest is Father Michael Schmitz. Father Michael is the chaplain of the University of Minnesota Duluth Student Chapel. He's the director of youth and young adult ministry in the Diocese of Duluth, and he's a fantastic speaker, a highly sought after speaker in the church today, especially for young people, but really for the whole range, folks, because I think God has really touched Father Michael, and I'm so glad to be able to introduce him really to EWTN. It's my understanding it's your first time on. Welcome, Father. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Thanks. No, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I, I, now, full disclosure, I was on Life on the Rock one oh, time. Oh, okay. Okay, So, good. I mean, but no one watched it. <laughs> so, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, like my mom watched it. She loved it. Yeah, for sure. She thought it was great. Well, Father, tell us, why don't you just tell us your story? Let's start there. Yeah. Um, well, as you said, I'm from Minnesota, and... Uh, I have a mom, like I mentioned earlier. If you remember back then, I remember <laughs> mentioning my mom earlier today. Um, no, so my mom, and my, my mom and my dad uh, raised six kids, and so I'm right in the middle there. There's three boys mm -hmm. and three girls, and uh, I'm the fourth. My older brother is uh, the first guy, first boy, and so I'm the middle of the middle. And um, yeah, I just grew up. And I always used to say I grew up in, like a normal Catholic home. In the, but people are like, what's normal mean? Like right. when we go to church every Sunday, they're like, that's not normal. I'm like, okay, well, um, well, we grew up. Um, that one of the rules was uh, go to mass every Sunday. So it was that, that kind of thing. And you know, we prayed normally. When I get to say pray normally, I mean just we didn't have like a family rosary. We didn't have a family, you know, holy hour. We just prayed before meals and prayed before bed. And um, it was like talk of the Lord and talk of church was kind of just normal. It just was felt natural, it wasn't kind of imposed. But what felt imposed for me was we had to go to mass every single Sunday and holy day. I mean, that was kind of the no exceptions. Um, that was the rule. And I hate, like I hated it so yeah. much. Um, my, uh, my, my parents had a rule though, that the only way you could get out of going to Sunday mass is if you were too sick to do anything else. And so um, the problem with that is if you were too sick to go to mass, then you couldn't do anything the rest of the day. I mean, but I, the crazy thing is, I didn't like going to mass so much that I thought it was worth it. Like, you know, I, I, I will um, pretend to be sick so I can get out of one hour of church and then have to sit in my room the rest of the day, not doing nothing. And you didn't have iPhones There's and TVs. No and all technology. The rest of the day. Yeah, I yeah. just, you know, and I don't think I think my mom even said no reading any books. If you're too sick to pay attention to mass, you're too sick to read a book. You know, I had to sit there by myself. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, I thought it was worth it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, something happened uh, when I was about 15. Uh, I had a, an encounter with the Lord. Basically, it started with um, an awareness. I can really it starts with a negative. It started with an awareness of my own personal sin. And what I mean by that is I had you know, gone to Catholic elementary school, and so I knew what the commandments were. But at that one moment, it just was so clear. All of a sudden, it was like, wait, but this is like sin. Like, that's something I've done. Like, it wasn't just on the outside. It was like on the inside. And I remember thinking, like, oh, my gosh, I, uh, I'm a sinner. Like, I re this, this clarity, not, like, not a condemnation, but more like a, oh, my gosh, that's, that's me. And then it was the next thought was just so good. It was like, I need a savior. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, hey. There is one. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they've been telling me for 15 years. Yeah, you know, right. this whole notion of like, I've been going to church and trying to skip church and going to school and hearing that Jesus is my savior, it didn't mean anything to me. All of a sudden, I'm like, wait a second, I'm a sinner. I need one. I need a savior. And I have one. And so then that the next step was, I need to pray. I mean, there was things, some things were very, very clear to me. One was, I need to pray. The other was, I need to go to confession. So it was, I need to pray, but I don't know how to pray. And so I knew that um, I had a rosary uh, hanging on my bedpost. And so I like, okay, well, 
I, I can use that. I don't know how to use it. I know there's Hail Marys involved. There's some right. Our Fathers involved. I'm not sure any more than that. My mom would pray the rosary every night. I come in, you know, to a room sometimes. She'd be sitting there praying. Um, but I'm not going to ask her because, you know, right. why would you ask your mom right. about right. God and stuff? And so um, it was like a Wednesday night religious ed. And there was a booklet called Youth Praise the Rosary. And I saw it. I'm like, oh, hey. So I asked the teacher. Her name is Sophie Heglin. Like, Mrs. Heglin, can I? Can I borrow that book? She's like, yeah, you, you can have it. Take it, you know? I'm like, okay, great. So I took it, and every night, like, I would, I would be, have the book, have my rosary. I'm like, okay, here's the next thing. Here's the next prayer. And just started praying the rosary. And Mary just was, it was really powerful. And when I say powerful, though, it was, like, subtly powerful in the sense it was just a, it was like a, a linchpin. Our Lady became this, and the, praying the rosary became this, like, this kind of anchor point in my life. Um, the other thing, as I said, was I had to go to confession. I, like, I knew, like, I need to go to confession. So um, I didn't know any better. So I, got, I, I didn't know that they had confession on Saturdays. I, mean, I, just, I just knew when we went as a school, that's when you go. But I knew where the priest lived. And so um, I remember very, very clearly, it was 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, summertime, and I got on my bike and rode across town to the priest's house and knocked on the door, and he was there because... You know, Tuesday, he only works one day a week, so he, of course he's home. <laughs> yeah. So he answers the door. I'm like, Father, can I, can I go to confession? Um, sure, come on in. So I sat on this couch, went to confession. I remember leaving that, um, leaving the rectory, stepping off the front porch, and there were three thoughts that were just so powerful in that moment. Like one was, God, I am so grateful. I'm, I'm so thankful for this. I, you've forgiven all my sins. You've taken all my sins away. I just can't. I'm so glad. My second thought was, and I never thought this before, my second thought was, God, if you want me to be a priest, I will hear anyone's confession whenever they ask me. And you were 15 at the time? Yeah. Okay. And I never, never thought about being a priest before that moment. Um, my third thought was, you know, my first thought, God, thank you so much. My second thought was, God, if you want me to be a priest, I'll hear a confession whenever you want me to. Then my third thought was like, oh, she's really cute. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like this. So then that began this kind of tumultuous, like, well, should I be a priest? I like girls too much. You know, this whole kind, yeah. whole kind of thing. But um, years later, just kind of fast forwarding, I would hear people talk about their conversion stories and like the moment where they encountered the Lord. Um, and I'm like, I don't know when I did, you know. I mean, I kind of was raised Catholic and it worked. I mean, <laughs> that was kind of yeah. what I thought. Until I read Pope Benedict's uh, Deus Caritas Est, or God is Love, and the very first page, I think the second paragraph, where he says, being a, result of, being a Christian is not the result of um, an ethical choice or a lofty ideal. It's a result of an encounter with a person that, uh, that he says, he uses the phrase, I think, um, gives one's life a new horizon and sets it in a decisive direction. And this must have been like 10 years ago, or whenever it first came out. Right. I remember reading it going, oh, oh my gosh, that was the moment. Yeah, because that's I, exactly I what happened to you. I can yeah. trace my, this, everything that happened in my, in my uh, like following as a disciple, Jesus, back to that moment where I stepped off that front porch, or we actually encountered Jesus in the sacrament, and stepping off that front porch and recognizing my life from that point had a decisive direction from that moment on that I can recognize. I'm just so grateful for that. So you began to really live for the Lord consciously. The best you yeah. could, right? Yeah. I mean, you had moments you, probably, you were a teenager. Thank you for the caveat. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the best I could. So when you got out of, you went through high school and you got out of high school, what did yeah. you do then? So I went to a college. So I, in high school, I was trying to figure out, should I go to a college seminary or not? And, and I visited some. And the whole time I was there, I kept thinking, like, I just want to be home. I just want to be home. I want to go see my girlfriend because, yes, I visited a seminary while I was dating. I wasn't in seminary. Let's clarify. Yeah. Um, but, but at one point, my dad was, he was, it was so good. My dad had said, he said, you know, um, he had discerned whether God was calling him to be a priest or not when he was younger. And a priest told him, he said, you know, if God's calling you, he'll always be calling you. And he said, if, if you're not sure that he wants you to go to the seminary now, then just, you, you can go. You don't have to go. You can go to a normal college. And that was this huge weight off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. My dad just kind of giving me permission to go to like a normal, or I say normal college, not seminary. Because um, I had thought that I thought that if I didn't go to seminary, I was saying no to God. But what I didn't realize, and I, I should have asked people about this, but what I didn't realize was you can't answer a question God isn't asking. Hmm. And so I can't say no to God if he's not clearly asking me to go to seminary. And I didn't know if he was clearly asking me. And then I found out later on that God always speaks in clarity. In that yeah. sense of like, okay, so if he's not clearly um, inviting me to go to seminary, not going isn't necessarily saying no to him. Right. And so I was just like, oh, it was a huge weight off my shoulders. So I went to another, went to a, a private Catholic college in Minnesota. Um, and I was so excited to go there because um, 
I mean, a couple things. One is I wanted to be able to study theology because 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you, the faith that's within you, um, had been huge in my life. And I wanted to study theology so I could give a reason. Like, why do I believe what I've been believing? Um, Secondly, I was so excited. There are you know, 220 monks on this campus. They had mass every day. There's a chapel 100 meters from my door. Um, my girlfriend only lived an hour away at this point. So I'm like, this is the best <laughs> of all worlds. <laughs> right. Um, and I, dis- I loved going to this school. And I describe it like this. Um, four years later, I graduated from this Catholic school with a degree in theology. I took so many classes in theology that I think I could have double majored in one topic. Yeah. Um, I was a missionary in Central America, working at a Catholic mission, uh, working at Catholic high school, teaching religion, going to mass every day, and I hated the Catholic Church. Wow, yeah. how, did you, how did that happen? I mean, what, what, what led you to experience that? Um, well, a couple things. One is outside of me, and one is definitely inside of me. Um, outside of me, it was, it was going to uh, the school where, I guess I'd say, a lot of times I'd have questions about stuff that like where the, the Catholic Church teaches something that seems to go against the culture and seems to be unique amongst other you know, Christian churches or domin- denominations. For example? Like things on like, uh, well actually this is the critical issue. This is the issue that, that started it and it's the issue that undid it. Um, the issue of contraception. That was it. I remember, I remember, I mean, because there's other things too, mm-hmm. uh, married priests, uh, ordaining women, all these kind of other things that seem like, well, this is so, you guys are really weird on this. But when it came to the issue of contraception, I remember asking professors and monks and nuns and PhDs and priests and about like, so what is this? And I, I, all I got back was, um, well, that's just this Augustinian framework where, you know, the body's bad and sex is bad. Therefore, you know, that's what we have to do this. But don't worry about it. The church is going to catch up to us doing this theology. So I started, it's kind of implanted this idea that, okay, well, the church is lagging behind, but theology is on the, on the forefront. Like doing theology means you're, you're pushing the boundaries and you're changing things. Like that my, in my mindset, that became like theology was you're changing things as opposed to you're really, you know, mining the, the tradition and the beauty, beautiful teachings. The idea that there was such a thing as truth that could be known was just like, no, that's, it's just opinion basically. Right. And so, um, but, the, but the issue that started it off was this kind of like no one giving me, or <laughs> me claiming that no one is giving me a clear answer with regards to why does the church teach what she teaches with regard to um, openness to life. Um, and then every other issue just kind of glommed onto that till, till I got to the point where I was like, you know what, I'm embarrassed to be Catholic because there's, we believe all these things. There's no reason for it. It's just yeah. holding on a bunch of old celibate white men in Rome who right. uh, are telling people what to do. So I get down to this. Oh, sorry. So the second piece was my own pride. <laughs> like, that right. was the external part. You're smarter was, than everybody. So it makes oh, sense man, yeah. that you're smarter than most of the herd. Yeah, I, you know what I, I mean? mean? Smarter in every way. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. just, oh, my gosh. So it's just the worst thing. So other people probably could have passed through that unscathed. But I think probably my own sinfulness and my own pride and my own all these things. Like I want it to be. I, I want to be on the edge. Like I want to be pushing down. I want to be changing things in that kind of a, a sense. And I just kind of, I guess, fell for it. Um, my own for my own stuff so I can't blame it on other people exclusively because I think others better people could have made it through that without right. without uh, falling off off like I did um, but I went down to this mission in Central America and it was run by the Society of Our Lady the Most Holy Trinity and uh, phenomenal order and this mission was incredible but I hated it immediately because I get there and these two priests were there and they were talking about like truth as if like it exists and the, <laughs> like the church is like, no, the church teaches truth. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Like, where are you from the middle ages? And I just, I would go to mass every day still, you know, and these priests would be up there and they'd be preaching. I would be openly like mocking the priests during mass. Wow. Like they, they, they'd, uh, I'm so bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's the pride. Um, so they'd be preaching and I'd be like, whatever. Yeah. Like, and we'd roll in my eyes and look, look at the person next to me like, that's stupid, you know. Now I realize as a priest sitting up there, standing up there behind the, you, you can see all that stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. oh my gosh. So, I mean, and we'd have meals with all the, with these two priests. And I mean, these guys were heroes. So they're, they're are, they're like the Marines of. Living a radical lifestyle for complete, the poor and for the Lord. Oh yeah. my gosh. Um, one of these priests, Father Tony, um, he, every morning he'd get up around five, go into the chapel or to the church for a holy hour or two. Then he'd get into his truck, grab, drive across the border into Guatemala, um, say mass here, bring the sacraments here. He'd go to the end of the road, get into, you know, cross the, cross the river with a canoe, hike, you know, until he gets to a village. And he'd just go from village to village all day, 
bringing the sacraments and bringing whatever kind of resources he could. It's beautiful. At, at night, yeah. he would say Mass at 6 o'clock on the Guatemalan side. He crossed the border, say Mass for us on the Belizean side at 7 o'clock. So one day, I had gotten incredibly sick, like so sick, they, they were like, he might die. Father Tony, after this huge day, um, he's crossing the little dirt alleyway between the church and the rectory to finally get some little rice and beans at the end of the day. And uh, someone says, Father, Father Tony, Mike's really sick. And this guy who I had, again, not just in church, but also like at our meals, like had been like making fun of and just been such a jerk to. This guy, without stopping, he runs back into the church, gets the holy oils and gets the Eucharist and runs over to where I was and offers me confession, anointing of the sick and communion. And this is, I, I remember lying there in this like delirium, you know, thinking like, huh, maybe Father Tony does know Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and my whole thing was like, oh, he doesn't know Jesus. He's all about the rules. Yeah. Like, wait, here's this guy that I've been, a, I've been a jerk to. Without hesitating, he came here with Jesus just to serve, just to take care of me, to make sure I was okay. Um, I should give him another chance, you know. So, but it took me a long time to get recovered. So maybe like, I don't know, three or four weeks later. So when did, when did you end becoming a jerk? When did that stop? When I... I think I'm planning on stopping it <laughs> this Lent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it back, yeah. cut back on being a jerk. Yeah. Yeah, I think 2019. Lent 2019, that's yeah, the plan. There you go, there um, go. No, but he, uh, so I thought, like, I'm going to give him another chance. And then, I, you know, I got better, and I saw him again. I'm like, yeah, I don't like that guy. But about a month after this, everything changed when um, there was, what Father Tony would do is every other Tuesday night, he would teach the teachers and one night he was going to teach on Humanae Vitae, which is the church's teaching on openness to life uh, against contraception. And I was like, I'm not going to go to that. I've, I've had my questions answered. I talked to PhDs and monks and nuns. And, the, and then I was like, no, I am going to go, and I'm going to destroy him. Again, that pride coming up, right? Um, I'm, going to just, I'm just going to demolish his argument, and just like everyone will know. Father Tony doesn't know. Mike knows, kind of a thing. So I can remember this so clearly. I went into the room where he was going to teach, sat in the back and just going you know, to fold in my arms, like, bring it, like, let's see what yeah. you got. And he started talking. And I thought he was going to talk like, you know, well, you know, the popes teach this, we need to believe this, which is probably true. But he started from this position of just common sense. And he said, well, we all know this is true, right? I'm like, well, yeah. And we know this is true, right? Mm-hmm. Well, therefore, and he started making these conclusions that I was sitting there thinking, I, that's true. That's just and it's not like mental gymnastics true, like where you kind of, if you squint and cock your head to the side, you can see there's a truth. No, it's like, no, this is just true. And halfway through his talk, my mouth is hanging open. And I'm like, <laughs> I've never heard, what? When he was done, I walked out of there. I mean, the world's just, and I, had, I was like 180. I'm like, I can no longer believe what I've been believing. I thought I was so right and the church was so wrong. And he just demonstrated to me that in this, in this one case, at least, that I was wrong and the church was right. I remember uh, coming back to my, the, the kind of little house shack we were staying in. I had two or three roommates, and they were like, they didn't go to the talk. They're like, hey, did you learn? Because they knew it was about sex. They're like, hey, did you learn how to do it? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, no, you guys, this talk was awesome. You should have been there because um, it changed everything. But that started this whole process of me having to like unlearn some stuff and relearn some stuff. But the best thing, the best thing that it did was this. I would describe my heart as being like kind of petrified or calcified. Um, really to, to the church and then to God himself. So I'd still been, every day I was still praying, God, if you want me to be a priest, let me know. Um, but I don't love your church. But if you want me to be a priest, let me know. So my plan was to go back, get my PhD in theology, scripture, whatever, and then teach. Um, I'm so grateful that didn't happen because um, I, would not been, have, I would not have been teaching with the church and I would have been very guilty of a lot of stuff. But the biggest thing was my heart. And that was that... Um, it had been calcified, petrified. And it was like this one night, that one day, it was like a little crack was formed. And because of the crack was formed, it was like my heart could then start pumping again a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like that beginnings of like, oh, that's what that feels like. Like that's what it feels like to have like love for God again, to have a like love for the church again, to have joy again. And, and that just, I'm like, I want more of this. And, but I had all these other questions that had, I had to ask. But now I had these people, Father Tony and the pastor there, Father John, who's a co-founder of, of SALT, um, who I could ask. I'm so grateful. And that, and that just began um, a more honest prayer of like, God, if you want me to be a priest, then let me know. Then how did you transition from the mission 
to seminary and ordination. Yeah, well, I was I was planning on getting married this whole time, by the way. Okay. Um, yeah. I was dating this girl for about three or four years, three years at the time. And we had talked about like, okay, when I get back from the mission, we'll have a year of planning for our wedding and then we're gonna get married the next year. Um, so that was a whole, you know, kind of wrinkle in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm here, I'm falling in love with the church and with the Lord the, again in, in this way, just like experiencing a joy of being Catholic and a joy of being a disciple of Jesus um, for the first time in a, a, since I was, I don't know, 19. And, um, and I was like, but wait, oh my gosh, I, I've not answered this question of whether or not God wants me to be a priest yet or if he wants me to go and, learn theology and or, mm-hmm. you know, study theology and teach. I don't know if he wants me to get married. And I, and so I just, I was also in this crisis moment of like, I need to figure this out because if I don't, if he doesn't tell me, then I'm going to be, you know, in big trouble. So that was renewed prayer, renewed seeking counsel. And um, I remember one day, very, very clearly, I was in adoration and it was just absolutely clear what the Lord was asking me to do. And this is after a lot of counsel, a lot of prayer, um, and he, it was just so clear. It was like, I would know. I knew that whether it was 60 years after I got married to this woman, who's an amazing woman, or six minutes, I would know that I never gave him the first shot. And I never gave him the first, first try. And, and what, I, what I essentially heard was, that's what I'm asking you to do, Mike. Like, I'm just, mm. I just, I'm asking you, just go to seminary. And I knew absolutely with this conviction in my mind, as well as in my heart and the depths, like, that's what I need to do. And the experience of that was simultaneously like crushing because I have to break up with this woman I'm in love with, but also joyful because it was like, I've been praying for this for 10 years every day. God, just let me know your will. It was one of these moments though that was so, it was permeated with, by freedom. Yeah. It was God saying, here's what I want you to do in this simultaneously, but if you don't, I still love you. Right. Which is so important. Right. It wasn't like you were if I don't do this, I'm going to be really out of God's will. And he's yeah. not going to, he wants you to make a free choice. Yeah. He's offering you something. Yeah. And it's interesting. It's inspiring actually to see the process and how patient he was with you. It's like, oh my gosh. He, needed to, he needed to soften your heart in a way that you could receive his word and receive the prompting and know, know his voice yeah. to be able to step into the next phase. You know? Well, I was, I was so impatient and I was like, God, let me know now. Let me know. I mean, and if, he, if I were to hear him, he would be like, you're not, you're not ready. I'm like, no, I'm ready. You just yeah. Let me know. In fact, I'm the smartest guy here. I know more than I, anybody. Know, I should God, get that collar I, on right actually, now. Actually, God, I have a schedule right here. You can, <laughs> you can follow mine. But there was something about that that recognized, he revealed to me that God is, he's never too late in revealing his will, but he's also never too early. And if he had even revealed this to me like two weeks before, I would not have been ready. It would have been like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, but he had just done that, even that process of softening for those last two weeks. It was like, I'm ready. This is painful, but yes, it's also joyful. And that made a huge difference. Great. And so you ended up going back to Minnesota? Yeah, yeah. And uh, going to the seminary right away? Yeah, basically. I, yeah. I applied that, that spring when I was still in, in Belize and then, uh, and then came back and entered in the fall. That's great. That's great. Well, Father, we're going to take a little break. Yeah. I want to tell friends about this booklet I just wrote called Light in the Darkness. And I wrote the booklet to help our listeners to follow the Lord more clearly. Jesus said at a certain point in uh, John's gospel, chapter eight, he said, uh, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. And yours is a story of discovering and experiencing that light and following him on the path. And lots of people today are kind of shaken by the culture that we're in, the challenges and people leaving the church and what's going on and they're troubled. And the place for all of us to go is right to the Lord himself because he wants to lead us, friends. So you're going to hear a little bit about the booklet. We want to offer it to you free. We'll be back in just a minute. Friends, we're living through difficult and challenging times. The church is in a fierce battle. In the words of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, man is pushing God from the human horizon. And as a result, the light which comes from God is disappearing and humanity is losing its bearings. In this moment, it's crucial that we hear the words of Jesus who said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I wrote this short booklet to help you lay hold of this precious promise from Jesus so you can have the strength and the courage you need to be a light in the darkness. To order your free copy of Light in the Darkness, you can go to RenewalMinistries.net or call 1-800-282-4789.
Welcome back, friends. We're here on Choices We Face with Father Michael Schmitz. And Father's been talking to us about really his journey, the discernment process of, of following the voice of the Lord. And you had some more thoughts about that. Well, yeah, because I, I know a lot of people will say, wait, you just said you're maybe planning on getting married. Like, what happened there? <laughs> um, because, or they'll say, was that easy? Was it easy to decide that, you know, I guess if this word the Lord is calling you, then you have to do this? Um, yes and no. Um, I would say that, I always describe it like this, that, on the surface, there was a lot of emotions, like a lot of sadness and a lot of heartbreak. But just under the surface, there was a lot of joy. Kind of like if you're ever scuba diving and it's like on, the, on the surface, it's all up and down this water. But if you go two feet under the water, there's this peace to it, you know, and that's what I experienced. Um, but it was interesting because with a lot of emotions, a lot of kind of, there was a certainty there. But when I got to seminary, I mean, this is one of those crazy things. When, when I got to seminary, I was like, okay, God, I'd meet, Okay, this is a little bit kind of a romantic in that sense. Like, I'd meet, like, uh, the gal who worked behind the library desk. Like, God, did you bring me here to meet her? You know? <laughs> um, or there'd be, you know, a friend of me introduced me to one of, you know, their girlfriends. Like, oh, God, did you bring me here to meet her? You know? I'm like, oh, my gosh, just focus on the Lord. <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I, but I had gotten set on the, the path to go to seminary, but after that, I didn't get any, like, illumination of, yeah, you're in the right place, you're in the place, other than, well, this, this is good. This is good. Keep going. It was never uh, more direction. It was just keep going, which for a while was great because, yeah, I'm just going to keep going until it was a couple months before ordination to diaconate where you make all the big right. promises, yeah. you know. And I'm like, gosh, God, you, is this where I'm supposed to be? You know, what, what if? I remember being in adoration again. And like, what if, God, what if I could have pictured this? I pictured the moment where I get ordained and then the next day I meet her, you know, kind of a thing. And there's a, one of the top five moments of grace in my life because I was in prayer and God was like, Listen, you can trust me. So it's like, God, okay, I trust that you brought me here. God, I trust not only that you brought me here, but that if you want me to leave, you'll let me know in a way I can't miss. And I'll, I, pr I trust that if you want me to leave, you'll let me know in a, in a way I can't miss in time. Because God does everything yeah. right on time. Yeah, Father, speaking of right on time, we just have a few seconds left. I just want to thank you for being here today and sharing your story. I wish we could do a few more programs yeah. with you. Hopefully we can do it in the future. <laughs> How about coming back? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, friends, this father's story is a story that's relevant to all of us. He just mentioned coming to the place where he could trust God. He could trust the voice of God. And what he discovered and what's led to an amazingly fruitful life and priesthood is a surrender to the voice of the Lord and to follow Jesus. Because that's the way forward for all of us. And you may be discerning lots of things in your life these days. Begin with just offering and opening your heart to Jesus. And before I close, I just want to mention that father's got lots of YouTube videos. If people just Googled Father Michael Schmitz or YouTube Father Michael Schmitz, they'll get them, right? Yep. The YouTube videos. We also have podcasts every week that come out on iTunes. Great. I want to encourage you to do that because he's fantastic. Join us again next week for another program of the choices we face. God bless you.